All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started today. It's good to see each one of you. Happy Mother's Day, and I uh, hope everybody's had an okay morning. And uh, uh, no special Sunday school. We're just going to stick with what we've been doing, but uh, do have some Mother's Day orientated messages both this morning and tonight. And uh, trust there'll be a, a blessing for you. But uh, last week, uh, we. Um, and I'm just going to say a few things today. We've been looking at the politics in the Bible, and we've been focusing on economics. And I'm going to finish that for just the first few minutes today. There's a couple other things that I just didn't really feel like getting into too much. Um, but we're going to fin- we talked about Social Security. I'm just going to make a, a – um, we'll talk about that a little bit. And then we're going to change gears and get into the environment, all right, and begin to look at what the Bible has to say about the environment. And um, – and so, but with uh, regards to Social Security, just kind of re- recovering or uh, regrouping or reviewing, I should say, um, that, you know, really, um, you know, it started back in the 30s, and at that time, it only collected 2% of the income. Now it's up to 12.4%, so obviously it's, it's grown a lot. Um, and uh, in the 30s, when it was started, only 6% of the population was over 65, and um, there were a lot of surpluses, and so they started giving away more benefits, but things have, have changed. You know, uh, now, um, today, that there are, uh, let's see, in 2000, that there were um, 35 million um, um, over 65, and in 2030, it's to be estimated that there will be 72 million people over the age of 65, or roughly 20% of our country's population. The key stat you want to look at with Social Security is the number of recipients compared to the number of workers. So the way they break this down is how many um, recipients do you have per 100 workers, all right? So back in 1945, you had two and a half recipients of Social Security for every 100 workers. By 2030, it is estimated that there will be 36 recipients for every 100 workers, and so that is a significant jump, and we talked about how that, uh, uh, according to the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, that this year of 2021, that the Social Security Trust Fund will begin to pay out more than it is taking in, and that it is estimated that this trust fund will be depleted by 2035. When that trust fund is depleted, uh, then Social Security would only be able to offer an estimated 79% of its current benefit. And so it's not that it'll just go away, it's just that it'll be about 80% of what they're currently doing. And so, so let's, uh, I want to give you some conclusions about Social Security, and we're going to look at, at the, the Bible and what it says. And these, again, we're not campaigning for policy. We're just looking at things from a biblical perspective. And look, in this world, there are going to be problems and things aren't going to be done uh, the way they ought to. When Jesus comes, he'll have it all figured out. But we should be knowledgeable so that we can have good dis- discussions. But uh, uh, So some conclusions about Social Security. If, if a paying healthy... What is Social Security doing? In some instances, not every, all right, but in some instances, it is paying healthy, potentially productive people not to work, all right? Uh, it, it, which, which that drains the life and vitality out of an economy. The idea that a healthy, productive people should retire at 65 and no longer contribute to the, to the economy, that is not found in the Bible. That is not a biblical mandate. There's nothing in the Bible that, that states this. In fact, let's do this. Let's look at some passages. Let's all turn to 1 Thessalonians 4. Um, we're going to be, and we're going to look at passages at both in First Thessalonians and Second Thessalonians. So let's go to First Thessalonians four. First Thessalonians chapter four, and let's look here um, at verse uh, ten. All right, uh, who would like to read for me? First, uh, Rosemary, can you read verses ten through twelve? All right, so in verse 11 there, it tells us to do your own business 
and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Now, the question here is this. When are you supposed to stop that? When, right, I mean, well, you either A, you don't, or B, you can't, or C, you don't have to. But, it, but it, you don't have to. Is that really a biblical basis? As I read this, God tells us to work. And there's no arbitrary age that says stop. Now, we can take other principles, okay, and develop it that if you physically can't, that's not what this is talking about, all right? Um, obviously, if you physically can't work, then you, you, you can't, and you should be taken care of. But to just arbitrarily pick an age that says, okay, you're done, is not biblical. There's nothing in the Bible that supports that. Now, I'm not saying that people can't do that. I'm just saying when it comes to the Bible, the Bible doesn't tell us at 65 we're done. Think about this from a pastor's perspective. Should pastors just retire at 65? I don't think so. Yeah, Jen, and you didn't hear it. Jen said, no, you can never retire. But she said, I'd be annoying. It's true. Um, no, here's the thing is that pastors that are in their late 60s and 70s, even up in their 80s, are, are, yeah, they're older and maybe they can't physically do the work, but they're a great resource of wealth and knowledge and wisdom. They shouldn't be retired. They should be helping people as much as they possibly can because they have a lot of insight and wisdom that younger guys don't. So I'm not saying people can't retire. I'm just saying it doesn't tell us... and and just so no one misunderstands me. That doesn't mean you can't go from one thing to another. In other words, like, yeah, you know what? I'm done with this job. Fine. But that doesn't mean you sit home and watch daytime TV all day. You see what I'm saying? You've got to go do something else. Uh, I, I'm glad Ron and Joyce are here. All right? Well, Ron, Ron's, Ron, how long have you been retired for? 91, 98, 98, 98. So that is 23 years. Ron has been retired for 23 years, okay? Now, in the 12 years that I've known Ron, the man is a busy man. He is going here, doing this. He is working. He, he's always got something going on, all right? And, 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 and now what has been going on may shift. All right, it may, it, it's changed. He, you know, might be in, t in years gone by, he's doing, a, doing his, you know, work projects. You know, right now there's a lot of medical appointments, so they're doing different things. But the point is, is that, the, that Ron's always doing something. Ron doesn't stay home and watch Days of Our Lives. <laughs> All right? He's moving. He's doing things. Now, Joyce, you still volunteer, don't, or you were volunteering. Are you still doing that? You still work, all right? So Joyce works so she can buy grandkids gifts, all right? That's that she works just so she can buy it. But so she, what I'm saying is, is that, you know, Ron retired from a good career, all right, and, and is, is busy. So I'm not saying don't, you know, you got to go to something else. And something else might be paid, it might not be paid, but you want to be productive. You want to do something. Because people that do nothing don't do well, all right? Now, sometimes people have jobs they love. They like doing them. And I don't feel that you should have to retire at 65, and I know you can go into your 70s, but, but literally there comes a point at around age 72 where if you don't retire, you're actually costing yourself money. And I've talked with people, they're like, I'm in perfectly good health. I love what I do. Why would I stop? And, 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 and then when you, once, you, once you go on Social Security, you can't work above a certain amount. And uh, which, you know, to which I say, for some, that works wonderfully because, you know, with our Christian school and not paying salaries, we'll give you something to do. But, uh, uh, you know, or low income. But, you know, uh, I want you to look over 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians, and look with me at chapter 3. 
Uh, can I get another reader? I, it's a lengthy passage. I'd like someone to read. Um, Steve, thank you. 2 Thessalonians 3, read verses 6 through 12. So in verse 10, we see that we're to, that if any does not work, they should not eat. And then it talks about the effect of not working in verse 11, that basically there's people get caught up in a bunch of gossip because they're not working because they got a bunch of time on their hands where they got nothing to do and they're getting into trouble. And, and so basically he's saying work. And again, there's nothing here, there's nothing wrong with the idea of, ha- let me say this, there's nothing wrong with having the, the idea of having a support system for people who are no longer able to work due to age. I mean, at a certain point, you just can't do it. Disability, involuntary uh, unemployment. In other words, sometimes people want to keep working and no one will hire them because they're of their age. That's, that happens. It's like, man, I would like to work, but they just, you know, they don't want, to, they don't want me. And, and so, but it, it, listen, it is foolish to pay mi- billions of dollars a year for retirement and medical benefits for people who are healthy, skilled, and experienced and are perfectly able to do the work and bring in benefit to the economy for many years after 65. So the idea, The entire system is burdened uh, by a flaw idea that it is, which is economically wise and and theologically unsupported. And here's the problem. It's maintained by a government, it's maintained by the government, even though it's a broke system that's rapidly heading towards not working. So why do they keep it? Well, it's simple. You change it, you're not getting reelected. Because... You have a huge voting block that wants it, so anybody who changes it won't get reelected. But in the end, it's 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 heading it's heading towards something that's not um, going to be uh, uh, w- won't work long term. The 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 second conclusion is that the 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 system is uh, deceptive. It was originally set up. Um, um, basically, it was originally set up that you were paying in for your, yourself, all right? You're setting aside money for yourself. That was how it was presented, but that's not how it functions. Now you're taking care of those that are retired. That's how it is now. So it was set up uh, uh, differently than it is. Thirdly, the entire Social Security system contains massive, wasteful transfer of money from hardworking people to non-working people, many of whom have no need for this money. Now, there are some who do, don't get me wrong, but there are a lot who don't. And so there are people getting money, they don't need it. They, they have no need for it. So the system is going bankrupt, and you have large numbers of people who are getting it who really don't need it. Now, there are people who do, but, but there's a lot who don't. And it's hard if you're one of the people who are like, man, I would, I, I'm on a fixed income, I, I need my Social Security. I know that. But I'm just telling you, there's a lot of people out there who don't need it, who get it, and it's literally throwaway money. It means nothing to them. So we're paying people, we're we're taking hard, so so you that are working, that are having Social Security taken out of your paycheck, it is being given to somebody who's not working, many of which who don't need it. That's the issue is we're taking money from people who need it and giving it to some people who don't need it. And um, 
another observation is that, that we have to ask the question, is it right for the government to provide some kind of guaranteed support for those who genuinely no longer are able to work? And, and, and I would agree that it is, due to old age, disability, or involuntary unemployment. And it would make sense to provide provisions for partial benefits to people who want to take a semi-retirement. In other words, it's kind of an all or nothing. So, like, if you take Social Security, you can't, and I don't, forgive me, I don't know the numbers, but you can't make above, like, $19,000 a year or something like that. Well, what about the person who's making, like, $100,000, $200,000 a year with a good job, who's paying taxes, and they're coming up on an age where they're like, you know, I like my job, but, man, I, you know, the, the hours are a little tough. I'd like to just kind of, and I have the flexibility of, of scaling back. The problem is they can't because they make too much money. So you, you run into this scenario where it's either they have to work full time and not collect, but it's wearing on them, or they take the Social Security, but now they can't do the job that they love anymore that they could put in a solid 25, 30 hours a week and still be paying taxes on that good amount of money their salary would come down some, and Social Security would offset it a little bit, so they would be taking a partial retirement, but they can't do that and collect Social Security because the government won't let them. So all you could do is just go get a minimum wage job that, for a lot of people, is just like, why bother? So there's, no, there's, there's nothing in there for that which would make sense to have that because it would fund more money. It would give more money to the government. Um, so... You know, uh, uh, so these are just some, some thoughts. So, again, why, why doesn't it change? Because no politician who changes is going to get elected. You said, what would the future be? I, I don't know. I have no idea. Um, I, w I would say there will probably be something. Will it be the full benefit? I, I don't know. Now, now for, let, me, let, me, let me just say this, all right? Given the current... Now, that's the system. Now, let's make this, let's take this down. Unless you make good money, all right, and you're in good health and like your job, but if, it, if you're scraping to get by, and I've, I've counseled several people on this. Man, when you're 62, if you're struggling to get by, it's worth taking. I mean, if you're working minimum wage jobs and struggling, it's worth taking because you're going to get X number of dollars and, and, and here's the point. If you're only making 20000 a year or whatever, and you're barely getting by, well, man, you take Social Security, you can still make that money. You're really going like, to double your income. And you say, but, but, but I'm losing. Listen, you're, yes, you're not getting the full benefit that you would wait if you waited till 62, uh, or 72, sorry. I understand that. However... When you do the math out of what you would get full benefit versus taking it day one that you're available, all right, when you do the math out, it's like literally, uh, gosh, I, I, I forget there's a magic number, but it's like 70, you, you know, you'd have, to, you'd have to live from the time you're 62 into your uh, mid-70s before you start losing money because every month you don't take Social Security, that money's just gone. So let's say it's $1,000, just round number. So, so every, every month you don't take it, you just lost $1,000 to gain down the road a few hundred more. Let's start doing the math out. It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So I'm losing $1,000 a month to gain 10 years from now $200 a month. So you have to add up that $200 a month how old would you have to be when it equals the amount of money you lost? All right? Now, if you have a good job, for, for, forget it. If you have a good job and you love your job, draw all this out. All right? Work. But if you're making $20,000 a year at minimum wage, you can still do that and collect Social Security. Now, I'm not saying, again, this is the system we have, and I'm trying to help God's people to be wise stewards of, of what they can. We're not changing the system, so we operate in it. Look, there's so much out there that if, <laughs> how, do, how do I wear this? This is weird. There's so much that benefits me that if I were in charge, I would change. 
all right? But I'm not in charge. So I'm going to take it and run with it, and I'm being perfectly obedient to the laws of the land. Now, I think it's stupid, but it's the reality. It's like, it's like the stimulus check. Do I think it's good? No, I think it's a horrible idea that it's going to cause inflation like you wouldn't believe, and we haven't even begun to see the ramifications of what our government has done. I think it's a horrible idea. But I don't make the rules, so I'll take the money. I'm redoing my bathroom. Ron's helping me. Ron's redoing our bathroom, and I stand there and hold things. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, so, I, you know, look, I don't agree with it. I'm just, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to stand before God and be held accountable for the decisions our government leaders made. I, I'll pray for them, and Lord knows they need prayer, because, look, if I, with limited intellect and understanding of economics can see this is disaster waiting to happen well then the people who are in charge they already know all right they already know interesting thing you know i've had a couple people tell me this you know how i talked about how lumber has uh has uh gone up like literally like almost four or five hundred percent it's not supply and demand Plenty of supply. It's inflation, basically. And it's just manifesting itself there. And you watch, it's going to have ripple effects. All that money came in, it's just made everything more expensive. And I was thinking about this. So all the money got given to the, for lack of a better term, to the people who have less money in the country. All right, there's a cutoff point. All right, so the people who had less money got it. You know what they're going to do? Spend it. You know where it's going to go? To rich people who don't need it. But they'll get it because they have all the businesses. And if the economy doesn't get better, it, it just, it, it, anyhow, it's nonetheless. So with that said, we're going to move on for economics, okay? Because we're just, you know, I, I try not, I don't want you to be bitter, okay? It's just uh, uh, be knowledgeable of what's going on out there. Social care, we can talk about health care. We can talk about different things. Um, I mean, we, uh, we talk about how to restart an economy. I, I basically, is drop taxes. That's kind of not, not met, get rid of them. I don't think you should do that. But just drop taxes, particularly on uh, the, the more elite rich, because they, they do a lot. They have a lot of money that they can uh, put into the economy. And that's usually the best way to start things, which we've seen over and over. I mean, every time a president does tax cuts, what happens? The economy does better. That's amazing, isn't it? And uh, when taxes increase, what happens? Eventually, the economy slows down. And so it's just a cycle. But we're going to get into uh, the environment now. And, and so let's, uh, let's go to the book of, uh, well, actually, I'm going to have several readers here. Um, let me, uh, I need three readers to start who'd like to read for me. All right, Kim, Genesis 1, 31. I need a second reader who'd like to read for me. All right, Yvette, Genesis 2, verse 15. I need a third reader. Sue, Genesis 1, verse 28. All right, and so what we're going to look at beginning today is the biblical teaching uh, on the environment. What does God have to say about the earth and the environment? And we're going to have a balanced approach on, on the environment. And so what we're going to see first is that in the creation, the original creation, everything was very good. So Genesis 1.31, um, Kim, if you could read that, I'd appreciate it. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. All right, so this was the world where there was no disease or anything that would ever harm humans. It was a world of great abundance and beauty and far beyond anything that we could imagine today. And Adam and Eve were included in the pronouncement of everything that was good. They were perfect. They were free from sin. They were not subject to disease, aging, or death. But even in this perfect world, God gave Adam and Eve work to do in caring for the garden. Go ahead and read Genesis 2.15. All right, so they were to dress it and to keep it. That means they had work to do. So work is not a part of the curse. Work is good. All right, it is good for man to work, whether that is a paid job 
or mom's taking care of kids at home, or it's when you're retired and you're doing projects around your house or helping people out or doing work at the church, or whatever. It is good to work. It is not good to be lazy and stagnant and do nothing all day. It is good to have a work that you do. Now, God also set before Adam and Eve the entire created earth and told them to develop it and to make it useful with this implication that they would enjoy it and give him thanks. Go ahead and read Genesis 1, 28, Sue. God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. All right, so it's really interesting. Right in the middle of this verse, we see there's the command to be fruitful and multiply, to replenish. That word means to fill, all right? To fill the earth with people. But notice what it says here, to subdue it. Now, when you subdue something, that means you bring it under your control. Now, we know that God has given multiple of resources in the earth and throughout the earth. And what God is telling us here is we are to subdue it. We are to bring the resources of the earth under our control. Further, we're to have dominion over all of the animal life. In other words, we're to be in charge over them, to have dominion. Now, because Adam and Eve sinned, God placed a curse on the entire natural world. The current state of the world today is not the way that God created it. After Adam and Eve sinned, one of the punishments that was imposed was a changing to the function of our world. It was no longer this idyllic Garden of Eden. Rather, it became a dangerous place to live. Can I get another reader? Uh, Genesis 3. Who'd like somebody else to read? Elaine, Genesis 3. Could you read verses 17 through 19? this point in human history, God caused tremendous change in the beautiful creation that he had made. God cursed the ground so that rather than bringing, uh, uh, whether it bringing forth abundance food uh, without any work, really, comparatively speaking at least, raising crops would require, as we saw in verse 17, sorrow. In sorrow shalt thou eat it all the days of thy life. That word sorrow has the idea of pain. In other words, what became abundant, the food that came so easily that you didn't have to do that much for, now is going to require a lot of hard work. The earth would now contain also, according to verse 18, thorns and thistles and many other dangerous and harmful things. So God's word told Adam that there would be danger and harm in the earth, that thorns and thistles would come forth. This is a a kind of poetic language because it, I think, in many ways represents hurricanes, floods, droughts, earthquakes, poisonous plants, poisonous snakes, poisonous insects. I mean, how many different animals out there one bite can kill you? Right? I mean, like, ugh, you know? And, uh, oh, it was great. I was, at, I was up uh, having Bible study with Lindsay the other day. And, uh, and, and <laughs> this is awesome. So Amanda's outside doing yard work. And we're having Bible study. And she comes. And she's, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But, but um, Lindsay, I need you now. There is a snake. <laughs> and, uh, and so we go out there. And she's like, it's under the rock. And we pick up the rock. And it was a salamander that had spots on it. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> and so... Uh, 
<laughs> but, but she was convinced it was a snake. She's like, it was bigger. It was bigger. But uh, it was great. Uh, so any, anyhow, um, so we, we see that, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of things out there that, that uh, along with hosts of wild animals, all of which make the earth a place in which is naturally beautiful and useful, they're mixed with elements of destruction, sickness, and death. And nature is not what God created it to be. It is, it is fallen. And this component of, of, of uh, Christianity has significant implications for how people view the environment today. So we view the, the creation that was perfect, we as Christians now view as fallen. This is not what God created. doesn't mean there are not beautiful things in it but they are intermingled with very dangerous things uh, that are not what God intended. So we would say, agree, our Christian perspective would say today that nature is fallen, and therefore what we think of natural and normal is not always good. So when we view nature, there's certain things about it that we do not view as good, but as a byproduct of the fall. So we have to protect our children from playing with certain animals, right? You know, if, if there's a bee's nest, you got to teach your kids, don't kick it, all right? You know, there's things we have to teach our kids about nature that are not good. We need to build flood walls and levees to protect from hurricanes. We need to heat our homes in the winter and cool them in the summer. We need to water our gardens because nature does not provide enough water for those plants to grow on their own. We have to have insect repellent because we will get eaten alive if we do not. Nature is fallen. It is not the Garden of Eden. And so we improve upon nature in thousands of ways to make it a more suitable place to live. If we were all about the, the, the earth and the way it is, you wouldn't heat your home and you wouldn't cool it in the summer. You'd say, oh, I just like nature. Yeah, when it's 95 and 100% humidity, I just love nature. No, I don't. All right, I don't love nature when it's 95 and 100% humidity, okay? I don't love it one bit. Give me the AC. Say, well, that's not good for the environment. I don't care, all right? I, that, that, I want to improve on nature, okay? Because right now, when it's, not, or when it's zero degrees, I want heat. I want to improve on nature. Why? It's falling, literally, the temperature. It's falling. I'm going to improve on it. I'm going to make it warm. The fact that nature is not perfect today has many other implications. We need to decide, for example, is it morally right to use insecticide? All right. We might decide that, that is it right to clear flammable dead branches uh, in natural parks to prevent forest fires? Is it right to cut down trees next to our homes so that they're not consumed by forest fires? Is it right to have seedless grapes, which are not natural, by the way? But who likes to pull seeds out of their grapes? What's that? Do those have the seed? Okay, well, you're, you're, you're entitled to that. But, I, I mean, how many, how, many, how many prefer seedless over as opposed to seeded? Okay, all right. Not natural, okay? How about this? Seedless oranges. All right? Seedless oranges and seedless watermelons. Not natural. I hate to break it to you, okay? They have been, they have been, what man has done is realized through different methodologies that we can develop these things. And so is it morally right to, to use biological research and selective breeding of plants to develop varieties of different things that we like? All right? Now, look, sometimes you go too far, all right? Sometimes you go too far, and there's consequences. We'll talk about that. So there's an element of tampering with nature that does go on, and we need to remember we are tampering with a fallen nature. Making natural products better, that is what God intends us to do. But we need to make sure we're making them better. Sometimes people mess with things, and they're not making them better. 
That's important to remember, all right? So we, have, we talk about different fruits where we, through selective breeding of plants, have come to realize, oh, we can have seedless. Yay, we like that. But then we can start altering things at a genetic level to make them more resistant to mold or insects, which is fine, but that's genetically modified foods. And what we're finding is that sometimes people can't digest them as well, particularly children. And that there's links with cancer with certain things. And so, 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 so you've got to be careful. We're dealing with a fallen nature, and so we need to constantly be evaluating what we're doing. All right? And so, but, we, but the point is this. We're trying to make things in nature better. It doesn't mean we always do, but we're trying to make things in nature better, and this is what God intends us to do. Part of our God-given task in, in subduing the earth and having dominion over it is inventing various ways to overcome the way nature is. God told Adam to subdue, in Genesis 3, a fallen world, implying that God wanted them to, him to improve on nature, meaning that God wanted... The creation to be investigated, explored, and developed. The problem is that we can make mistakes in our attempts to subdue the earth. And sometimes those results can be very harmful. This is where evaluation, all right, evaluating those attempts to determine if they're helpful or harmful in assessing the results. It is that does not dismiss with tampering with nature or attempting to modify what what is natural all right it's just that we need to be careful about it and again if you say oh, i think we leave nature alone then don't use insect repellent on you how many have them zappers uh, at your house you are messing with nature you are interfering with the natural process all right? You're like, that's right, I am. That's right. And, and, and does God have a problem with that? Well, considering all the, the diseases around the world that insects carry, I don't think so. All right? Because didn't we have some, like, in the last year or so, some West Nile in Massachusetts? Yeah, two years ago? Because last year no one tracked anything. But... Uh, Everything was COVID. They had COVID. It wasn't West Nile. It was COVID. But anyway, uh, you know, but the point I'm making here is, is this, is that do you, so do you want to have some insect stuff around your house when your kids are outside playing? Yeah, you do. I don't have a problem with that. But you are interfering with nature uh, as, as it is. So, so you, you're tampering with nature. You're attempting to modify what is natural. And by the way, it's morally right and part of what God wants you to do to have subdue the earth and have dominion over it. And this is uh, not an area in which Christians should automatically assume what is natural is better. It's merely, merely a matter of evaluating the, the, what's been going on. We need to look at it. So by contrast, the radical environmental movement, so when you think of like a crazy you know, environmentalist, they do not understand nor believe that nature is fallen. And... They think the natural world is ideal and therefore oppose ordinarily beneficial human efforts to improve upon the way things exist in our current world. The, uh, these, lead, uh, these lead people to oppose factories, dams, residential developments. I mean, basically anything that's built. It's like, if you're going to build anything today, there's usually some environmental lawsuit associated with it that just delays this thing forever. And no matter how carefully it's constructed, being sensitive to protect the surrounding environment, because um, there's a problem. Why? Because for the, the, the unbelieving environmentalists, their highest good, their, their God in some sense, is the earth and nature untouched. Thus, they oppose everything that changes uh, a habitat or the growth of trees or making, uh, uh, and they make nature God. And this is not consistent with the biblical world, uh, with the biblical worldview. Now, it is not wrong for human beings to modify the world, but they need to do so in a safe manner. We don't need to, 
I don't want anybody to misunderstand. We should not be like polluting the earth and throwing our trash out on the street and not caring about our environment. We should care about the environment. But we also should be biblical in our approach when, when God said to subdue the earth and to have dominion over it. And, and he, all the, the resources in the earth, God gave them to us. And he gave them to us to utilize. And, and so I believe there's a lot of misinformation out there about what exactly is good and not good. And, and uh, you know, I mean, you take, you know, the global warming. All right. Look, yes, there is stats that show the earth is getting warmer. There's also evidence to suggest that the earth goes through cycles of warm and cold. And how much is being impacted by the things in the world today? I, I don't know. Do I have a problem with certain emission levels? No, I think that that probably is, is good. But do you want to know what the biggest producer of carbon dioxide is in the world? It's not your car. It's you. All right? It's us. It's people. And when you start listening to some of the quotations of environmentalists, you know what their solution is? Is less people. I'm serious. Like, I'm not kidding. Now, they, 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 I mean, you, you have people like, you know, Ted Turner, who started Turner TBS, all right? I mean, this guy talked about, you know, it'd be ideal for, like, the world's population to be half a million people. Yeah, he said that. How many heard Jacques Cousteau? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, he's got some real nice quotes about reducing populations by like, three, you know, like, of, you know what that is, it's murdering people. Now they don't come out and say, well, I'm not saying kill people, I'm just saying ideally we should like to bring, well, how, like, how do you think we're going to get there? You know, I mean, you just, you have uh, all these things that, 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 you know, environmentalists want to reduce population because we're overpopulated, we're told. Can I tell you we are not overpopulated? This world is not even close to being overpopulated. The, the, now, granted, you wouldn't have much space, all right? You wouldn't have much space, but you'd have some personal space, not much. It wouldn't go over well in COVID. But you could take the whole world's population and stick it in Jacksonville, Florida, Just one city. Every person on earth could fit in there. Now, granted, it'd be a little tight. But you'd still have some space. You know, a couple, a couple square feet. And, uh, you know, and uh, so uh, it, 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 we're not overcrowded. If certain areas are overcrowded. Didn't God tell us to spread out? And what does man always do? groups together and congregates in cities. It's hard for us. We feel in the Northeast, we say, man, yeah, it is crowded. That's because we don't leave here. All right? We don't leave the Northeast. If you go anywhere else, I mean, take a, take a, a plane ride across our country, and you know what you're going to see? Nothing. The whole lot of nothing for a long, long time. It is wide open. We just group together. We congregate. And I understand people need to work and so on, and, uh, and, and these things happen. But, but, but you know, we need, it is okay to modify and utilize the world's resources as long as we're doing it in a safe manner, and we must constantly evaluate the results to make sure that it's safe. There's nothing wrong with evaluating to make sure you're doing it right and to make sure, you, you know, if there's a way you can do it better. In other words, like, I'm, I'm not against, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, having oil, but, like, you know, when there's an a, a oil rig disaster, you, it's not good to pour a bunch of oil into the ocean. That's, that's not good. That's destructive and wasteful, and we need to evaluate, well, why is that happening? Now, that doesn't mean don't take oil out of the ocean. It just means do it right, all right? Don't be neglectful or wasteful, and don't put people's lives at danger, for, for the almighty dollar. And usually what you're going to find is people are cutting costs money-wise when disasters happen, not always, but usually it's because we're trying to save money. All right? You, the Titanic, 
You know why it sunk? They went on the cheap because it got expensive. And they used a certain type of, of rivet, I think, if I understand it right, that was cheaper. And that's why the boat sunk. Spent all this money on the boat and went cheap on one important thing. And lots of people lost their lives. So we're out of time for today. We'll talk about this more. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the day, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to begin to learn about the environment. Uh, we have much to learn on this topic. Father, bless us as we continue in it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.